Is that the uh, motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. Do I hear a second to the motion? Second from Indiana. Discussion to the motion to amend. I uh, recognize the commissioner from California. I would just like to suggest to the gentleman making the amendment that if we're going to do that, we should eliminate section three and renumber section four to section three. Would that, uh, would you want to make a substitute motion to amend? Yes. So substitute motion to amend is to then eliminate section three as well and renumber section four as section three. Is that correct? Do I, have a sec do I have a second to the substitute motion to amend? Second. Second from? Oregon. Oregon. Uh, so we have before us now, and let me come back to you in, in your comments on the substitute motion to amend to the maker. I, I'm, I'm fine with uh, the, the substitute amendment, but reserve my right to speak to the amendment. Fr friendly, friendly substitute amendment. Uh, second, I'm sorry, the second was from? Oregon, Oregon, the second on that. Discussion is now to the substitute motion to amend. Uh, let me go to Wyoming. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe I get to speak to my amendment. Then you can discuss my amendment. I'm sorry, please. Thank you. Uh, this was debated in our committee, and the rationale, that, and we were divided as a committee, the rationale behind striking the two-thirds of both houses of Congress was that, again, why would you let the fox guard the hen house? If you truly want to reserve the power back to the states and have a say in a judicial decision, why would you let the Congress also have that same say? If a Congress passes a law, the Supreme Court overturns that law, the Congress then gets to come back and say, we just disagree. So. That was the logic and the rationale for removing Congress and reserving that right back to the states. So with that, Your Honor, or Your Honor, I've been in court too much, those, those lawyers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, no black robes here yet, thankfully. <laughs> uh, the discussion is to the substitute friendly motion to amend. Let me go to Wyoming, then Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. President. On and against this amendment and for the proposal, uh, really what this amounts to is checks and balances, and right now um, we have antiquated checks and balances for the Supreme Court. To really, there is no checks and balances as it is for the Supreme Court because of the antiquated checks and balances that exist right now. So what we wanted to enable to do is to have those checks and balances not only at the federal level, where you have Congress who would be able to check the power of the Supreme Court, but then also uh, give another option, which was the states, then to check the, uh, the, the balance of power for the Supreme Court as well. So if you eliminate this uh, two-thirds of both houses of Congress, you effectively eliminate any kind of checks and balances that would exist within the federal branch, reserving that only to the state. And so therefore, I would urge this body to reject this amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner from Oklahoma, my apologies. I should have come back to you on the motion to amend. No problem, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, the reason I liked leaving the language as was, including the two-thirds uh, of Congress, um, simply is, to the previous speaker's point, including them in the checks and balances, but more practically, state legislatures do not meet year-round like Congress does. Some of them only meet every other year. Some of them have very specific limits about how special sessions can be called. And so, the, in my mind, the thinking here is that if something comes out of the Supreme Court that needs very rapid action, Congress being present has the ability to act on that while the states get organized um, does anybody really think three-fifths of the states are going to vote on something in six months? So Congress being there can do that. It allows it. But we placed a higher bar on Congress to make sure that it, was, it had such a uh, heavy majority and provided the balance that our founders anticipated um, uh, to the Supreme Court. So 
So I favor leaving the language in there, but I wanted to explain to everybody why it was there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me go to the Commissioner from Alabama. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, rise in opposition to the amendment. Uh, when the gentleman explained the reason for the amendment, that it would, uh, uh, he, he seemed to indicate that this would take away from the state's ability to provide a check and balance uh, to the Supreme Court. And uh, I see nothing in, uh, in the original language that takes away from the rights of the states. This just adds another layer of checks and balances on a uh, runaway judiciary, and I would uh, oppose the amendment and urge this body to reject the amendment, and uh, let's have two sets of checks and balances on the court. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me recognize the Commissioner from Texas, then we'll go to Colorado, Indiana. Mr. President, I rise in support of the amendment. Um, I want to point out that we just passed probably one of the most important uh, amendments that this convention can pass, which is limiting the commerce power of Congress. Well, by not adopting the amendment here, by a two-thirds vote of Congress, Congress can override that. Congress can actually increase its commerce power by a two-thirds vote when a court strikes down any act of Congress that doesn't comply with that provision. We're here today to limit the power of the federal government. We're not here today to expand it or to add new checks and balances for other branches of the federal government. And we're here to increase the power of the states. Uh, Congress has tools in its toolbox already in order to check the power of the courts. It can abolish federal courts. It can create new federal courts. It can increase the size of the Supreme Court. Nine is no magic number. So when we add a provision like this that empowers a congressional veto over, over rulings of the Supreme Court that actually check its own power, uh, we're granting Congress a very, very big power. Um, this amendment needs to be passed uh, for the sake of, of, of empowering the states and limiting the power of the federal government. And as far as checks and balances go, I mentioned there are checks and balances on the Supreme Court. And I defer to the Founding Fathers that those are adequate, sufficient uh, checks and balances for the federal government branch on another federal government branch. Uh, so I support the amendment, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. As uh, compelling as some of the arguments have been made uh, for this amendment, I rise in opposition to the amendment and wish to uh, point out uh, some practical considerations that uh, we should bear in mind, and that is that the Supreme Court, uh, by, um, by tradition, ends their session in June, and most of the more difficult decisions will indeed come at that point in time, at which many of the states are not in session. And so it's, it's an absolute certainty, in my mind, that if something comes through the court that does need this extraordinary action, that the states will not be available for a significant amount of time. And far too often the decisions made have ramifications that make it an established fact if immediate action cannot be taken. Uh, I'll not name any specific case, but I will tell you that in, in June of 2015, there were some issues that needed some attention that this overall uh, amendment could have remedied. And therefore, I believe Congress should be empowered to take this action as well as the states. I'm voting no on the amendment to the proposal. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll go to the Commissioner from Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment. One of the prior speakers mentioned rapid action in Congress in the same sentence. I've never heard that before. <laughs> Uh, I, I would only um, advise that I think that if an issue rose to this level of uh, attention that virtually all of us have the option to go into special session if it were necessary. Obviously we're discussing hypotheticals here, but I would say uh, that this entire body has been organized to discuss reasserting states' rights over the federal government. And insofar as we have that common thread, 
I absolutely believe that uh, enshrining a role for the states in this process is integral to reform efforts. I am much less confident that adjusting the balance of power between the three branches of the federal system is something that we ought to entertain at this point. I think doing this as a state initiative uh, is the way to go, and I will uh, be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Camuto. Florida, South Dakota. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And this, uh, I'll speak to this amendment, but more broadly, the proposal, which is also related to the uh, abrogation proposal that came out of our committee uh, regarding executive and congressional action. Uh, I, I think we need to be very thoughtful about uh, what we're really advocating uh, by setting to the states the ability to overturn uh, decisions or actions of the three branches of government. I think it introduces uh, some of the basic infirmities that the Articles of Confederation had uh, and the reason why the Constitution was created in the first place. These problems were designed to be addressed by a Senate that was appointed by the states. The infirmity we struggle with today is the 17th Amendment. And, and we can talk about the realities or the proposals uh, we could uh, bring forward to amend that infirmity, uh, but this undercuts the very purpose of the Senate. The Senate at that point becomes a rump uh, institution whose job is simply to uh, uh, ratify treaties and appointments. Uh, the states now taking over almost all of their purpose. Uh, the other uh, thing I would note is uh, we were admonished yesterday morning to be very careful about what we send out of this process, uh, that it be proposals that have a realistic chance of 38 states adopting. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we should take our lead from uh, reforms that have been adopted at the states, uh, those which have broad and wide uh, support, such as term limits. I don't know of a single state in which the political subdivisions of our states have such a radical authority over our legislatures. And while I certainly understand and recognize that the relationship is much different, uh, the states create both our political subdivisions and the federal government, the average person and the average legislator is not going to recognize that distinction. And this, I believe, could be easily thwarted from adoption uh, through simple misunderstanding on that key point. Uh, for those reasons, I would oppose both the proposed amendment and the underlying resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner from South Carolina, then Connecticut. South Dakota. South Dakota. Of South Dakota, excuse me. I'd rather have South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in favor of this amendment and also in passage of the uh, resolution. Originally, I thought this would be a good way to check the federal can you, courts. Excuse me, can you hold your mic closer? Absolutely. Um, originally, I thought this would be a good way for multiple checks on the federal courts, but then I realized that in South Dakota, in our body, there are times when we decide to suspend the rules by a two-thirds vote. And many times, I think that it is completely inappropriate that we vote to suspend the rules. There's nothing I can do about it in a minority case. But in this case, if we allow Congress to have the veto over the court decision in this point, we would essentially be allowing them to suspend the rules, except for those rules would be the Constitution. And I think that that's too dangerous of a power to give. They already have, as mentioned previously, other ways to check the courts, and I think they should use those. So I encourage you to pass the amendment and pass the resolution. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner from Connecticut is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of this amendment. Um, I heard uh, the word antiquated uh, used in reference to the uh, checks and balances as provided in the Constitution. I think at a convention of this sort, there's no word which is more terrifying to me. I think that uh, one of the reasons we're here is because we have great faith in the wisdom and vision of the founders of the country and the balance that they provided, which, if it has not worked perfectly, has worked uh, with remarkable effectiveness over over more than two centuries. Uh, some of the other checks which the uh, legislative and executive branch have on the judiciary, judicial branch have been mentioned, but I think the fundamental one has not, that the judicial branch is the child of the other two branches, that while the president and the Congress are elected by the people, the Supreme Court is selected by the president and approved by the Senate. There could be no more potent check now, like a child, uh, the 
child may not grow up exactly the way we want them to be, but they are in fact our child and we have that um, responsibility for them. What I would say too is, this uh, two-thirds of the both houses of Congress then throws the balance off in the sense that it gives one of the other two branches a check on the Supreme Court, but not the executive branch. Now, I would not suggest that the president be given a veto power over Supreme Court decisions either, but if that makes you hesitate, I think giving it to Congress should as well. And I would finally say historically, uh, we, given where we're coming from generally as a group, may look at the decisions of the Supreme Court over the last uh, nearly a century as having been bad for the country. But if we go back to the early days of the New Deal, there was a time when the Supreme Court was the group that was holding up uh, conservative values and trying to prevent the growth of executive power. And um, the Congress in those days would easily have been able to override the Supreme Court decisions with the huge majorities that came into the New Deal. I think that removing this uh, makes this amendment uh, closer to the founding visions, the founders' vision, and I will support the amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me go to the Commissioner from Oregon, and then we will come to Virginia, then Minnesota. Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. Yes, state your position. State your point. The amendment is on the table. It is my amendment. If I were to uh, remove the amendment in substitute for the author of the amendment agreeing to postpone discussion to a time certain for purposes of, I know Mr. Eastman and others have potential amendments that they're proposing to offer uh, on this, whereby we might be able to clean up the language a little bit and get a better consensus and bring it back. Would that be, uh, would that be possible? I believe you can withdraw your amendment at any time before the vote under the rules that we've stated. <laughs> to withdraw, we, we, we've, got our, we've got our supplemental rules. Okay. So I believe under our supplemental rules, we, you can withdraw the amendment. We would need a separate vote on postponing in time certain. Okay. So uh, I could recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma following you. You can withdraw your amendment on your own accord, and then we can go to the gentleman from Oklahoma if you'd like. Would the, would the gentleman to, from Oklahoma uh, yield for a question? Uh, the underlying maker of the motion, would you yield for a question, Commissioner? Certainly. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. That yes, is a big recognize. man right there. <laughs> <laughs> the question that I would have is, as the current language, any decision of the Supreme Court. In a situation where, if this were enacted, when you have something like Bush v. Gore, where the Supreme Court makes a decision, that is any decision where it would bump up against other constitutional parameters and requirements, I don't see a remedy uh, for something like that? I think that's a different question than we were starting to talk about, which was probably my willingness to hold this to a, a date or time certain. Oh, then I will withdraw that question if you want to address the previous. And this is, I'll need some help on the rules. Um, what I don't want to do is effectively table this until some other day, since we're limited on time. I would be willing to step out and try to work on some language, especially if there is another, another amendment that somebody's about to propose. Um, and perhaps after our lunch period, uh, come back with a reworked version. Now, I may reject all of that, but in the spirit of timeliness, I'm willing to do that. Did that sound, okay, so, so I think in, in order, uh, Commissioner from Oregon, do you withdraw your amendment? Yes, I would withdraw my amendment. So the amendment is withdrawn, and then Commissioner from Oklahoma, are you proposing that we uh, move to have this on a time certain, uh, and I would suggest the item following lunch. We may be able to take up one more item before lunch, and we would take this up immediately after whatever, if we, if we finish before lunch. Would that, would that work? That would work for me. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. A second from uh, Alaska. Um, let me, let me place that motion. The motion is to postpone this item 
taking it up as our first item upon finishing whatever item we may take between now and lunch. Uh, is that perfectly uh, obscure? Okay. We will take this up as the, as the following item after we, whatever we finish after lunch. Chairs of your committees, uh, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. Okay, the item is, is postponed until uh, after our next item. We will now then go to proposal two from the Federal Legislative Executive Jurisdiction Committee. Proposal two, let me go to Chairman uh, Standridge. Commissioner from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Next proposal that we have, once again, I'd like to thank the work of our subcommittees. Um, the abrogation subcommittee worked very hard on this, and I sat in on the committee and did a lot of great work. I'd like to recognize uh, Chairman Casper, um, who uh, to speak to this uh, proposal and, of course, elicit maybe some of the help from the members that helped craft this. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. President. We have uh, uh, titled this uh, proposal number two uh, in our subcommittee, Abrogation of Federal Law. And I'd like to, before I begin, define abrogation. Abrogation means to nullify or to render unenforceable. And our subcommittee felt that was a better term than some of the other terms that have been used in this area. So. If to proceed under Section 1, the state shall have the authority to abrogate any provision of federal law issued by the Congress, President, or administrative agencies of the United States, whether in the form of a statute, decree, order, regulation, rule, opinion, decision, or other form. We left out uh, the treaty possibility and the courts, so Section 1 would not apply to treaties or to courts. And some may ask, uh, what does the word opinion mean uh, in keeping the language in? And that was pointed out by uh, Professor Barnett and others that administrative agencies do issue opinions. So we felt we needed to keep opinion in. Section two, such abrogation shall be effective when the legislatures of three-fifths of the states approve a resolution declaring the same provision or provisions of federal law to be abrogated. The abrogation authority may be applied to provisions of federal law existing at the time this amendment is ratified. So we can go back to prior law or obviously going forward. We had a discussion in the subcommittee about what percentage vote should we use for abrogation. Some favored just a simple majority at 26. But the majority of our subcommittee and the vast majority of our full committee favored a three-fifths votes of the states, which would be 30 votes. Section three, no government entity or official, and here is a correction that needs to be made because it was printed wrong. No government entity or official, our subcommittee and full committee struck the words whether federal, state, or local so uh, when it's appropriate, Mr. President, I would offer an amendment to strike those words if it has not already been uh, done. Uh, Professor Barnett pointed out that no government entity means no government entity. And we also were pointed out that, in general, the United States Constitution does not apply to local government. So it would read, no government entity or official may take any action to enforce a provision of federal law after it is abrogated according to this amendment. Any action to enforce a provision of abrogated federal law may be enjoined by injunction by a federal or state court of general jurisdiction in the state where the enforcement action occurs and costs and attorney fees of such injunction shall be awarded against the entity or official attempting to enforce the abrogated provision. We wanted to protect uh, the state uh, right very, very strongly uh, against uh, lawsuits where they, the people who did not wish to, uh, or who had abrogated, would have their attorney's fees uh, paid for, uh, for the protection of the opportunity to, to continue on with that action. Section four, no provision of federal law abrogated pursuant to this amendment may be reenacted or reissued for six years from the date of abrogation. We wanted to protect from the Congress immediately turning around on an abrogated situation 
and uh, pass a new statute that would be almost identical to what had just been abrogated. So the section one is our authority, section two is the procedure, and section three is the enforcement part of the uh, proposal number two, uh, Mr. President. And uh, I would move that we would adopt an, an amendment striking the words whether federal, state, or local from section three. And uh, if it needs another motion, so be it. Otherwise, I would then move the uh, adoption Commissioner, of the to, proposal. Commissioner, to clarify, you said that was a Scrivener error? Yes, it was. Uh, without objection, we'll strike the words. Uh, without objection, we'll strike the words whether federal, state, local. Hearing none, we'll correct that Scrivener error. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. So with that, Mr. President and uh, members of the convention, uh, I want to thank the subcommittee who worked very, very hard. And I want to especially recognize Representative Merrill Nelson from Utah, who was very instrumental in helping draft this type of language that, uh, as an attorney, uh, was very much, we, our subcommittee felt very expert in the Constitution in the area that we're discussing. So with that, I would move adoption of proposal number two. Motion is to approve adoption of proposal number two from the Federal Legislative Executive Jurisdiction Committee. Do I hear a second? Second from Arkansas. Discussion to the motion. The gentleman from Delaware is recognized. Mr. President, thank you very, very much. Uh, like most of the people in this room, I share great value for limiting uh, the unchecked power of federal government. But we did create a federal government to exercise some powers on our behalf. Um, it was a nullification crisis of 1830 under General Jackson when he was serving as president that helped move this country from these United States are to this United States is. Uh, it was the Civil War of 1860 that once again um, kept us together. Uh, if not for that, today we would be two or more states. Uh, like, like many people here, I want to see the power checked, but I don't know that uh, a vote of abrogation of lawful acts of Congress in this case is the best solution. To the sponsor of this, I would say I'm comfortable if there was a way to, to, to handle administrative proclamations and rulemaking and even executive orders of the president, which uh, appear to uh, be unchecked, although I, uh, Congress can override them, but having a state override in that area is okay. But I, I do have some heartburn with the idea that we subject every act uh, of Congress to a complete override uh, as this would appear to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner from Arizona is recognized. I know, I'm pulling this up, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Will the Representative Merrill Nelson from Utah yield to a question? I believe that it would be a question to the maker of the motion, and he may yield his time. Would you? That's uh, fine. Uh, will, the, will the sponsor of the motion yield for question? Uh, Mr. President, I would. Proceed. Thank you. And I am not a constitutional attorney, but I do have a question that um, in Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution is the Supremacy Clause, where uh, it says that any um, laws that are in conflict, that the, con the federal laws will um, be supreme over the state laws. So if we adopt this and this amendment is ratified, will this be in conflict? Will there be a, 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 con a conflict within the Constitution itself with two different um, directions on how to handle state and federal laws when they are in conflict. Thank you, Commissioner. Sponsor of the uh, question, do you yield time? Mr. President, I yield time to the question and to uh, Representative uh, Nelson for the answer. Uh, the Commissioner from Utah is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, this would not create a conflict uh, with the Supremacy Clause. I just want to explain a little bit, lay a background in answer to your question. Uh, first of all, the reason we need this amendment is because the federal government has expanded way beyond its federal powers on which we can argue that it's supreme. But over the past 100 years, with the passage of the 17th Amendment, states have lost the constitutional check on Congress. This amendment 
uh, attempts to restore that check. You have proven that the people are ready to hold the first Article 5 convention in the history of this country. I congratulate you, I salute you, may God bless you. Thank you for being here and let's get to work.